Hey folks, I know I am just an old guy telling stories, but please leave a like and subscribe before we start. Let's enjoy in today's stories. I never thought I'd be the type of person to do something so stupid, but desperation does things to people, especially when you're a high school senior on the verge of not graduating. I wasn't a bad student, or at least I didn't think so. I tried hard, but no matter what I did, my grades kept slipping and my chances of getting into a decent college were fading fast. It started with chemistry. No matter how many hours I spent staring at those equations, they just didn't make sense. Then it was math. My teacher, Mr. Allen, was one of those old school guys who thought everyone should understand calculus as easily as breathing. He never offered extra help, and if you didn't get it, you were on your own. I had always been pretty average, but this year, something was different. The pressure was higher, and my focus was all over the place. I remember the exact moment the idea first crossed my mind. I was sitting in my room, surrounded by crumpled papers and half-empty energy drinks. The thought hit me like a punch to the gut. What if I could just change my grades? No one would ever know, and I could finally get out of this nightmare. It wasn't like I was trying to cheat the system for fun. I just wanted to make it through the year. I started doing some research. At first, it was just idle curiosity, googling things like, how to hack school grades and hire hacker to fix grades. Most of the stuff that came up was either fake or way too expensive for a high school kid with barely any allowance. But then I stumbled onto something deeper, something that led me to a part of the internet I'd only heard about in rumors, the deep web. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I read about it online, heard the stories, but it still felt like a distant, almost mythical place. But after spending hours digging around, I found myself on a site that offered services for almost anything you could imagine. There were people advertising things like stolen credit cards, counterfeit money, and of course, hackers for hire. It was like opening a door to a whole new world, one I probably shouldn't have even known existed. One ad caught my eye. It was simple and to the point. Hacker for hire, discreet and reliable, no job too small. The price was steep, but not completely out of reach if I dipped into my savings. The guy went by the name Ghost Zero One, and from what I could tell, he was the real deal. There were a few reviews, yeah, actual reviews, saying he had done some impressive work. My heart was racing as I debated whether to reach out. I knew it was a bad idea, but I was at the end of my rope. It was either this or face a future of fast food jobs and disappointing my parents. So, I did it. I contacted him. The conversation was short. He asked for my school's name, the system they used, and my login credentials. He didn't ask why or even seem curious. It was just business to him. He assured me it would be done within a week, and I'd never have to worry about it again. I remember feeling this strange mix of relief and terror as I sent the payment. Relief because I thought my problems were finally going to be solved and terror because I knew I was crossing a line I could never come back from. For the next few days, I was on edge, constantly checking my phone and email for any updates. The anxiety was eating me alive, but I kept telling myself it would all be worth it. I was careful not to mention anything to my friends or family. This was a secret I was taking to the grave. I just had to hold out until I got the confirmation that everything was done. But then, things started getting weird. I noticed a black SUV parked down the street from my house one afternoon. It wasn't the usual neighborhood car, and I swear I saw someone sitting inside, watching. At first, I brushed it off as paranoia. Maybe I was just freaking out because of what I'd done. But then it showed up again the next day, and the day after that. Always in the same spot, always at the same time. I tried not to let it get to me, but the more I thought about it, the more it felt like a bad omen. And then, Ghost Zero One went silent. The messages that had been coming through almost daily stopped. No updates, no responses to my questions, nothing. Just silence. I tried to convince myself that everything was fine, that he was just busy with other jobs, 
but the feeling in the pit of my stomach told me otherwise. A week later, my grades hadn't changed, not one bit. I was still failing chemistry and math, and now I had the added stress of wondering if I'd just thrown my money into a black hole, or worse, if I'd been caught. I didn't know what to do. Should I try to contact him again? Should I just wait it out? The uncertainty was killing me. Then, about ten days after I first reached out to him, I got a message. It wasn't from Ghost Zero One. It was from someone else. The subject line just said, We need to talk. I remember feeling my blood turn to ice as I opened it. The message was brief and direct. We know what you've done. Meet us in the school parking lot after dark. Come alone. Tell no one. That was when I knew I was in way over my head. I couldn't believe what I was reading. My heart was pounding so hard I could hear it in my ears and my hands started to shake. My first instinct was to delete the message and pretend I'd never seen it, but I knew that wasn't an option. Whoever had sent it knew what I'd done. They had me, and now they wanted to meet. I read the message over and over, trying to make sense of it. We know what you've done. It was vague, but specific enough to send my mind spiraling into panic. My thoughts raced. Was this a trap? Could it be the police? Or was it someone else? Someone connected to Ghost Zero One? The more I thought about it, the more questions piled up. What if they had proof? What if they were going to blackmail me? I considered ignoring it, but I knew that wouldn't make the problem go away. They had me cornered, and whoever they were, they weren't going to let it slide. I had no choice but to do as they said. I needed to figure out who was behind this and what they wanted. The rest of the day passed in a blur. I tried to act normal around my parents, but I could barely focus. Every noise in the house made me jump. I kept glancing at my phone half expecting another message, but none came. It was just that one ominous line. We need to talk. The words echoed in my mind like a broken record. When night finally fell, I felt like I was walking into a nightmare. The school parking lot was about a 15 minute walk from my house, but it felt like hours as I made my way there. The streets were quiet, eerily so, and I kept looking over my shoulder half expecting that black SUV to pull up beside me. But the streets were empty. When I got to the school, the place was deserted, just as I expected it would be. The lights in the parking lot were dim, casting long shadows that made everything look distorted and eerie. I could see the outlines of the school building in the distance, its windows dark and lifeless. It was strange to see the place that was usually bustling with students so quiet, like it was holding its breath waiting for something bad to happen. I stopped at the edge of the parking lot, trying to make out any movement. For a moment, I wondered if I was alone, if this was just some sick joke. But then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a figure step out from behind one of the parked cars. My heart skipped a beat. The person was dressed in all black, a hood pulled low over their face. I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman, just that they were tall and moved with a calm, deliberate pace. They approached slowly, stopping a few feet away from me, and for a long moment we just stood there staring at each other. I felt a cold sweat break out on my skin. Who are you? I finally managed to ask, my voice barely above a whisper. I hated how scared I sounded, but I couldn't help it. The figure didn't answer right away. They just stood there silent like they were sizing me up. When they finally spoke, their voice was low, almost a whisper, and completely devoid of emotion. You're in a lot of trouble, you know that? I felt a lump form in my throat. What do you want? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. The person took a step closer and I instinctively took a step back. What I want, they said, is to make sure you understand the seriousness of what you've done. I swallowed hard. Are you with the police? The words tumbled out before I could stop them. It was a stupid question, but I had to know. The figure let out a cold, humorless laugh. 
No, I'm not with the police, but they're not far behind if that's what you're worried about. They paused, letting the word sink in. Ghost Zero One got sloppy. He was arrested yesterday. They're going through his records now, tracing every job he's done. Your name is on that list. The blood drained from my face. This was worse than I'd imagined. If what they were saying was true, it was only a matter of time before the authorities showed up at my door. I could see my entire life crumbling in front of me. My future, my family, everything I'd worked for. But I didn't. I started to say. But the figure cut me off. Save it. I'm not interested in your excuses. What matters now is what happens next. I felt like the ground was slipping out from under me. What do you mean? The figure's voice was icy cold. You have two choices. One, you come clean. Go to the police, tell them everything, and hope for leniency. Or two, you keep your mouth shut and deal with the consequences when they come knocking. Either way, you're done. The words hit me like a ton of bricks. I couldn't think straight. My mind was racing with all the worst case scenarios. I imagined my parents finding out. The shame, the disappointment in their eyes. I imagined getting expelled, having to explain to everyone why I wouldn't be graduating. And worse, I imagined the police, the questions, the charges. My stomach churned with fear. But why, why are you telling me this? I asked, desperate to understand why this person was even here, talking to me. The figure was silent for a moment. Then they sighed. Because I've seen kids like you before. Kids who make stupid decisions out of desperation. You think you're the only one? Trust me, you're not. But this, this is different. You're playing with fire, and you're about to get burned. I didn't know what to say. Everything was happening so fast, and I felt like I was drowning in the gravity of what I'd done. Listen, the figure continued, their voice softening just a fraction. You're in a tough spot, but you can still make a choice. Do the right thing, and maybe, just maybe, you'll get out of this with your life intact, or don't, and let it all fall apart. But either way, you need to face the consequences of your actions. I stood there, frozen, as the figure stepped back into the shadows. Think about it, they said, their voice fading into the darkness, but don't take too long, time's running out. And then they were gone, disappearing as quickly as they had appeared, leaving me alone in the empty parking lot with nothing but the sound of my own breathing and the weight of the decision that now lay on my shoulders. When I got back home that night, I felt like I was sleepwalking. My body was on autopilot, moving through the motions, but my mind was a swirling mess of fear and uncertainty. I barely slept, tossing and turning as I replayed the encounter in the parking lot, over and over again in my head. By the time morning came, I felt like I hadn't slept at all. But I knew I couldn't avoid school. Not today. Walking into the school building that morning felt surreal, like I was walking through a dream. Everything seemed normal. Kids were chatting in the halls, teachers were setting up for the day. But to me, everything felt off. The weight of what I had done was pressing down on me, and every face I saw felt like it was looking right through me, like they all somehow knew what I'd done. I tried to keep my head down, to avoid eye contact with anyone. The last thing I needed was for someone to start asking questions. But even as I walked to my first class, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. The whole day I was on edge, jumping at every loud noise, every sudden movement. It felt like I was waiting for the other shoe to drop, for the inevitable moment when everything would come crashing down. And then, in the middle of third period, it did. It started with an announcement over the intercom, calling several students to the office. I remember the exact words. Will Jack Thompson, Emily Miller, and Ryan Hayes please report to the principal's office immediately. My heart skipped a beat when I heard my name. I looked around the classroom and I could feel every eye on me. My teacher gave me a puzzled look, but I could barely meet her gaze. My legs felt like they were made of lead as I stood up and gathered my things. The walk to the principal's office felt like a death march. My mind was racing, trying to figure out what was happening. 
Had they already found out? Was this it? As I turned the corner and saw the office doors ahead of me, I noticed Jack and Emily walking just a few steps ahead. They both looked as confused as I felt, which only made my anxiety worse. When we got to the office, the secretary gave us a tight smile and gestured for us to sit down. Mr. Harris will be with you in a moment, she said, her voice calm but with an undertone of something else, something that made my stomach turn. We sat there in silence, the three of us exchanging nervous glances but not saying a word. The clock on the wall ticked loudly in the quiet room, each second dragging on like an eternity. Finally, the door to the principal's office opened and Mr. Harris stepped out. He was an older man, stern but fair, and usually the type to smile and make small talk. But today his face was grim. Come in, he said, his voice flat. My heart sank even further. We filed into the office, and I couldn't help but notice how small the room felt with all of us crammed inside. Mr. Harris gestured for us to sit in the three chairs in front of his desk. The walls were lined with framed certificates and photos of past students, all smiling and proud, a stark contrast to the tension filling the room. Mr. Harris sat down behind his desk and folded his hands in front of him. He didn't say anything at first, just looked at each of us in turn, as if deciding how to start. The silence was unbearable. I could feel the sweat on the back of my neck, and my hands were trembling slightly. Do any of you know why you're here? He finally asked, his voice calm but with an edge to it that made my stomach drop. None of us answered. We all just shook our heads, though I could tell from the look on Jack's face that he was just as nervous as I was. Emily looked like she might cry. Mr. Harris sighed, leaning back in his chair. This is serious, he said, his voice low and deliberate. It's come to our attention that someone has been attempting to access the school's grading system without authorization. We've been contacted by the authorities, and there's a very serious investigation underway. My heart stopped. This was it. I was done. But why were Jack and Emily here? What did they have to do with this? Mr. Harris continued, Now I'm going to ask you all some questions, and I need you to be completely honest with me. This is not the time to hide anything. The police will be involved, and it's in your best interest to cooperate fully. I could barely breathe. I could feel the walls closing in, the reality of what I had done crashing down on me. I wanted to say something, to confess, but the words were stuck in my throat. Jack... Mr. Harris said, turning to him first. Have you ever tried to access the school's computer system outside of normal use? Jack looked horrified. No, sir, I would never. I don't even know how to do that kind of stuff. Mr. Harris nodded, but his expression didn't change. He asked Emily the same question, and she shook her head, looking like she might burst into tears at any moment. Then he turned to me. Ryan, what about you? I felt every eye in the room on me, and the weight of their gaze was almost too much to bear. I knew I was caught. There was no getting out of this. But even as I opened my mouth to speak, the door to the office opened, and the school resource officer walked in, followed by two men in suits. The room went silent. The officer looked at Mr. Harris and nodded, then turned to us. We need to speak with Ryan Hayes he said, his voice firm but not unkind. That was it, the end of the line. I stood up on shaky legs, my heart pounding in my chest, and followed them out of the office. As we walked down the hall, I could see other students watching from their classrooms, their faces pressed against the glass. I knew what they were thinking. They were seeing me as the kid who had done something terrible, something unforgivable. The rest of the day was a blur. They took me to a small room and asked me questions. So many questions, they knew everything. The payment to Ghost Zero One, the messages, everything. They had all the evidence they needed, and there was no point in denying it. I confessed to everything. By the time they were done, my parents had arrived. I could see the shock and disappointment in their eyes as they listened to the officers explain what I had done. 
My mom looked like she might faint, and my dad just kept shaking his head, unable to believe what he was hearing. They told me I was suspended immediately, pending further disciplinary action, which could include expulsion. The school had a zero-tolerance policy for this kind of thing, and they were making an example out of me. The police didn't arrest me on the spot, but they made it clear that there would be legal consequences. My parents would likely have to pay a fine, and I could be charged with a misdemeanor, which would stay on my record for the rest of my life. As we left the school that day, I felt like my entire world had crumbled to dust. The weight of my actions hung over me like a dark cloud, and I knew there was no going back. I had made a mistake, a terrible, life-changing mistake, and now I had to live with the consequences. The days after my suspension were some of the darkest I'd ever experienced. The house, usually filled with the sounds of TV or my mom cooking in the kitchen, was eerily quiet. My parents barely spoke to me, and when they did, it was strained, their words clipped and heavy with disappointment. My mom's eyes were red-rimmed from crying, and my dad, well, he just seemed like a different person altogether. He wasn't the type to yell or get angry, but the silence between us was worse. It was like a wall had gone up, and I wasn't sure it would ever come down. The first morning after, I woke up, and for a brief, blissful moment, I forgot what had happened. But then it all came flooding back, and the pit in my stomach returned. I didn't know what to do with myself. I couldn't go to school, and I wasn't sure I'd ever be going back. The reality of it all hit me in waves. What this meant for my future, for my family. I tried to distract myself, but nothing worked. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw the disappointed faces of my parents, the cold, calculating look of the men who had interrogated me, and the smirking faces of my classmates as they watched me being escorted out of school. The worst part was knowing that everyone knew. The news spread like wildfire, and by the end of the day, everyone in school, and likely the entire town, knew what I had done. I avoided social media entirely, too afraid to see what people were saying. I didn't want to see the jokes, the memes, the cruel comments. I didn't want to face the reality that my life as I knew it was over. It wasn't long before the letters and calls started coming in. The school district sent an official notice that I was to be expelled. There would be a hearing, but everyone knew it was just a formality. The school board had a strict no-tolerance policy for breaches of security and they weren't going to bend the rules for me. My parents tried to appeal, but it was clear from the start that it was a losing battle. The police, too, were a constant presence in our lives now. They made it clear that while I wouldn't be going to jail, the charges were serious. Unauthorized access to school systems, tampering with records. These weren't just school violations, they were crimes. I was looking at a hefty fine and a permanent mark on my record something that would follow me for the rest of my life. But the worst part was the effect it had on my family. We weren't rich by any means, and the fines, legal fees, and everything else were going to put a huge strain on us. My parents tried to shield me from it, but I could see the worry in their eyes, the late-night conversations that stopped the moment I walked into the room. My mom stopped cooking dinner, and we ate takeout almost every night, sitting in silence, the tension so thick you could cut it with a knife. My friends, or at least the people I thought were my friends, started distancing themselves from me. At first, I thought it was just because they didn't know what to say. But as the days passed, it became clear that they didn't want to be associated with me. The texts stopped coming, the invites dried up, and soon I was completely alone. It was like I'd become a ghost in my own life the person I used to be fading away into nothingness. One afternoon, a few days after the suspension, I decided to take a walk to clear my head. The house was suffocating and I needed to get out, even if just for a little while. I wandered aimlessly through the neighborhood, avoiding the streets where I might run into anyone from school. I ended up at the park, sitting on a bench and watching the world go by. Kids were playing, parents were chatting, and for a moment, it felt like everything was normal. But then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a group of kids from my school. 
They were laughing, carefree, like nothing had changed. And why would it have? Their lives were still on track, their futures secure. I wasn't prepared for what happened next. One of them noticed me sitting there and whispered something to the others. They all turned to look at me, and I could see the sneers on their faces. I didn't know these kids well, just some people I'd seen around school, but their looks cut through me like a knife. One of them, a guy I vaguely recognized from my chemistry class, walked over and stood in front of me, arms crossed, a mocking smile on his face. Hey Ryan, he said loud enough for everyone around to hear. How's it feel to be the school's biggest loser? I didn't answer. I just looked down at my feet, hoping he'd go away. But he didn't. He leaned in closer, his voice dripping with malice. I heard you're getting expelled. That's gotta suck. What are you gonna do now? Flip burgers for the rest of your life? His words stung, but I didn't let him see it. I knew that reacting would only make it worse. He waited for a response, and when I didn't give him one, he laughed, a cold, cruel sound that echoed in my ears long after he walked away. That was the last time I left the house for a while. The humiliation was too much to bear. I stayed in my room, hiding from the world, hoping that somehow this would all just go away. But deep down, I knew it wouldn't. This was my reality now, and there was no escaping it. The hearing came and went, just as I'd expected. My parents and I sat in the small, stuffy room, facing a panel of stern-faced adults who had already made up their minds. They listened to the facts, nodded at the appropriate moments, and when it was over, they delivered the verdict. I was officially expelled. I would not be graduating with my class, and my chances of getting into any decent college were now non-existent. My future had been ripped away, all because of one stupid, desperate decision. The drive home was silent. My mom was crying, quietly, and my dad just stared straight ahead, his knuckles white as he gripped the steering wheel. I felt like I was drowning, suffocating under the weight of my own guilt and shame. I wanted to apologize to tell them how sorry I was, but the words stuck in my throat. What could I say that would make any of this better? Nothing. There was nothing I could do. When we got home, my dad finally spoke. His voice was low, calm, but there was a sadness in it that cut me to the core. Ryan, he said, turning to look at me, you need to understand that actions have consequences. What you did, it's going to affect you for the rest of your life, but it's also affecting us. This isn't just your burden to bear, it's ours too. I nodded tears stinging my eyes. I wanted to tell him I understood, but I didn't. Not really. I was too caught up in my own misery to fully grasp the impact this had on them. But I knew one thing. I had let them down in a way that I could never fix. That night, I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, thinking about everything that had happened, the choices I'd made, the people I'd hurt. I didn't sleep much. I couldn't. The reality of what I'd done was too overwhelming. And then, in the darkness, I realized something. This wasn't just about what I had done, it was about what I was going to do next. I had messed up, badly, but I couldn't just give up. I had to find a way to move forward, to make something of the mess I'd made. But how? I had no idea where to start. The days following my expulsion were some of the hardest of my life. It felt like I was living in the aftermath of a storm that had left everything in ruins. My parents were still struggling to come to terms with what had happened, and I couldn't blame them. I had shattered their trust and rebuilding it seemed impossible. The weight of my actions pressed down on me every single day, making it hard to even get out of bed in the morning. But I knew I couldn't stay like this forever. As much as I wanted to, I couldn't just hide in my room and pretend the world didn't exist. I had to face the reality of what I had done and try somehow to move forward. The first step was the hardest, admitting to myself that I had messed up and that the only person who could start fixing things was me. 
It began with a simple conversation with my parents. I sat them down one evening after dinner, my heart pounding in my chest, and told them everything. Not just the facts. They already knew those. But how I was feeling. How scared and lost I was. I told them how deeply sorry I was for what I had done. Not just to myself, but to them as well. I didn't expect them to forgive me right away, and honestly, I didn't deserve it. But they listened. Really listened. And for the first time since everything had happened, I felt like there was a small glimmer of hope. My dad was the first to speak. Ryan, he said, his voice soft but firm. We're hurt and we're angry. But more than anything, we're worried about you. We want you to understand that while what you did was wrong, it doesn't define who you are. What matters now is what you do next. Those words stuck with me, what I do next. It was clear that I couldn't undo the past, but I could control what happened going forward. And that's when I made a decision. I was going to make things right, as much as I could, and that started with taking responsibility. The next morning I called the school and asked to speak with Mr. Harris. I wasn't sure what I was going to say, but I knew I needed to apologize. He agreed to meet with me, and when I walked into his office, the weight of everything hit me again. The last time I'd been there, I was full of fear and shame. This time I was determined to own up to my mistakes. Mr. Harris, I began my voice shaking a little. I just wanted to say how sorry I am for everything I did. I know I broke the rules and I put the school at risk. I understand now how serious my actions were and I take full responsibility. I'm not asking for any favors or for you to change your mind about the expulsion. I just needed to tell you that I'm truly sorry. Mr. Harris looked at me for a long moment, his expression unreadable. Finally, he sighed and nodded. Ryan, it takes courage to come here and say that what you did was wrong and there are consequences for those actions, but I believe you when you say you're sorry. I hope you take this experience and learn from it so you can move forward and make better choices in the future. I thanked him and as I left his office, I felt a small sense of relief. It wasn't much, but it was a start. The next few weeks were all about finding a new direction I knew I wouldn't be going back to school, so I started looking into alternatives. My parents and I discussed enrolling me in an online program so I could at least finish my high school education. It wasn't ideal, but it was better than nothing. The program allowed me to work at my own pace, and while it wasn't the same as being in a classroom with my friends, it was something. It gave me a purpose, a goal to work towards, but school wasn't the only thing I needed to focus on. I knew I had to make amends for what I had done, not just with my parents, but with the community as well. I started volunteering at a local community center, helping out with after-school programs for kids. It was strange at first, being around kids who looked up to me when I felt like I was the last person anyone should admire. But over time, I began to see the impact I could have in a positive way. It felt good to do something right something that could actually help others instead of hurting them. My parents were hesitant at first, worried that I was taking on too much, but as they saw how committed I was, they started to come around. The tension in the house slowly began to ease, and while things weren't back to normal, there was a sense that maybe, just maybe, we could get through this together. One evening, a few months after everything had happened, my dad came into my room. He handed me a small box, looking a bit uncomfortable. I know this has been a rough year for you, for all of us, he said, but your mom and I are proud of the way you've handled things since, well, since everything. We wanted to give you something to show that we believe in you, that we know you're going to get through this. I opened the box to find a simple silver watch inside. It wasn't anything fancy, but it meant the world to me. I looked up at my dad, and for the first time in months, I saw a hint of the pride he used to have in me. Thanks, Dad, I said, my voice thick with emotion. I won't let you down. The road to redemption was a long one, and I knew I wasn't done yet. I had a lot of work to do to rebuild my life, to prove to myself and to everyone else that I could be better. But I was determined to do it. 
I had made a terrible mistake, but I wasn't going to let it define the rest of my life. Looking back, I can't say I'm glad it happened, but I can say that it taught me more about myself than I ever thought possible. I learned that actions have consequences and that no matter how far you fall, you can always find a way to stand back up. It won't be easy and it won't be quick, but with the right mindset and the support of the people who care about you, it's possible. In the end, that's what life is about, making mistakes, learning from them, and trying to be a better person tomorrow than you were today. And while I'll always carry the weight of what I did, I'm also carrying the lessons I learned. That's something no one can take away from me. I'm not usually the type to do something stupid on a whim, but there's a first time for everything, right? It all started last Friday after work. I had heard about the dark web before, like most people do, from those YouTube videos or online horror stories. Most of them seemed like urban legends, stories about hitmen, bizarre cults, or illegal markets selling God knows what. But part of me, the curious part, wanted to see what all the fuss was about. I guess boredom played a role too. I didn't want to take any risks by browsing the dark web from home, so I decided to head to an old internet cafe across town. It was the only one I knew that still existed. I hadn't been there in years, but I figured it was a safe bet. Anonymity in an anonymous place. When I arrived, it was like stepping back into the early 2000s. The smell of stale coffee, the hum of outdated computers, and the flickering fluorescent lights made the place feel more like a time capsule than a functional business. Only a couple of other people were there, each lost in their own screen. No one seemed to care that a new face had walked in. I picked a computer near the back, far away from the entrance, where I wouldn't be disturbed. I booted up the old machine and noticed it was running some antiquated version of Windows. It took a few tries to connect to the Wi-Fi, but once I did, I downloaded Tor. It felt almost too easy. Within minutes, I was inside the dark web, navigating its strange, unfamiliar interface. It wasn't as flashy or high-tech as I imagined. It was more like an underground market with pages that looked like they were straight out of the early internet. Plain text, basic HTML, no real visuals to speak of, but that somehow made it creepier. I started by browsing some forums. Most of it was harmless, albeit weird. People talking about conspiracy theories, swapping pirated software and sharing coded messages. It was like a digital ghost town where only the strange and paranoid seemed to gather. But then I found a link to a chat room it had a cryptic name, something like the Mirror Room. Out of morbid curiosity, I clicked on it. The room was nearly empty, just a few people in there, each with a username that looked like random strings of numbers and letters. I didn't know what I was doing, so I just watched the conversation for a while. Most of it was just random chatter, people asking for links or trading illegal stuff. I thought about leaving, but then someone posted a message that caught my eye. It was just a simple sentence, but it sent a chill down my spine. I can see you. For a second, I thought it was some sort of inside joke, but then another message appeared, this time directly aimed at me using my username, which I had created just minutes earlier. Nice shirt, John. My heart skipped a beat. I was wearing a dark green flannel, something I thought was pretty nondescript. I quickly looked around the cafe, there was no one near me and the other patrons were still glued to their screens, oblivious to what was happening. I wanted to convince myself it was a prank, that someone had somehow hacked the webcam on my computer, but this PC didn't even have a webcam. My thoughts started racing, and just as I was about to log off, another message popped up. You really should have picked a different cafe, John Doe. This time it included my full name. My stomach dropped. I hadn't used my real name online, not even close. My hands started shaking as I quickly typed out, who are you? No response. The chat went completely silent. I panicked and shut down the computer as fast as I could. My hands were sweating and my mind was spinning with a thousand questions. I practically ran out of the cafe, my heart pounding in my chest. I knew I needed to get home somewhere I felt safe. I jumped in my car 
fumbling with the keys as I tried to start the engine. My mind was racing. How did they know my name? How did they know what I was wearing? It didn't make any sense. As I pulled out of the parking lot, my phone buzzed. I ignored it, focusing on the road, but it buzzed again and again. I was too freaked out to check it. My knuckles were white as I gripped the steering wheel, trying to calm down. But then it buzzed a fourth time, and against my better judgment, I glanced at the screen. It was a message from an unknown number. My heart sank as I opened it. It was a picture of me, taken just seconds ago, sitting in my car in the parking lot of the cafe. I slammed on the brakes, my breath caught in my throat. The world seemed to tilt, and for a moment, I felt like I might pass out. I didn't know what to do, who to call, or where to go. My mind was a blur of fear and confusion. In a blind panic, I floored the gas pedal, speeding down the road, trying to put as much distance as possible between myself and that place. But my fear had taken control. I wasn't paying attention to where I was going. Then, out of nowhere, I saw the tree. I yanked the steering wheel to the side, but it was too late. The car spun out of control and smashed into it head on. The impact jolted me, but somehow I wasn't hurt. I sat there, dazed and trembling. The front of my car crumpled against the tree trunk. My heart was racing and I felt like I couldn't breathe, but I was alive. And that was all that mattered, right? I wish I could say that was the end of it, but things were about to get much worse. Sitting there in the wrecked car, the reality of what just happened began to settle in. The car was totaled, but that wasn't my biggest concern. My phone had slipped out of my hand during the crash, and it was now lying face down on the floor of the passenger seat. I didn't want to pick it up. I was terrified of what might be waiting on the screen. I took a deep breath, trying to steady myself. The eerie silence after the crash was unsettling, broken only by the faint creaking of the damaged metal around me. My head was pounding, not from any injury, but from sheer panic. What was I supposed to do? Who could I even tell about this? It felt too surreal to be happening. Eventually, I forced myself to retrieve the phone. My hands were still shaking as I unlocked it. I almost wished I hadn't. There were more messages, each one worse than the last. The first was another picture, this time of my car at the moment of impact taken from the same angle as the last one. The timestamp was only seconds old. Whoever was doing this, they were still watching me. I scrolled down, hoping to find some clue about who was tormenting me. Instead, I found another message, this one just as cryptic and terrifying as the others. Running won't help, John. My heart pounded in my chest. They knew where I was, what I was doing, but how? I glanced around, looking for anything out of place. A car parked nearby, someone hiding in the bushes, anything that could explain how they were tracking me. But the street was empty. There was no one around, just the quiet, dimly lit road and the dark trees looming over me. I realized then that staying put wasn't an option. I needed to get out of there, away from wherever they might be watching me. I pulled out my phone again and dialed 911, but before I could even hit call, another message popped up. Don't call anyone, John. We're closer than you think. That was it. I dropped the phone like it was burning my hand and scrambled to get out of the car. My legs felt weak, barely able to hold me up as I stumbled onto the road. I could hear my heartbeat in my ears, each thud echoing through my head like a drum. I needed to calm down, to think rationally but every nerve in my body was screaming at me to run, to get as far away from that place as possible. I looked down the road, trying to figure out where to go. I wasn't far from home, maybe a 15-minute walk, but I didn't want to go back there, not when they could be watching. Instead, I started walking in the opposite direction, heading for the main road where I hoped I'd find some semblance of safety. It was late, and the streets were deserted, adding to the eerie, unsettling feeling that I was being hunted. Every shadow seemed to move. Every distant sound made me jump. 
I kept checking behind me, expecting to see someone following. But there was nothing. The silence was suffocating. I wished for some sign of life. Anything that would break the tension and let me know I wasn't alone in this nightmare. As I walked, I tried to piece together how this could be happening. Was this some elaborate prank? Had I somehow stumbled into a hacker's trap? The logical part of my brain tried to offer explanations, but none of them made sense. The dark web was full of horror stories, but I never believed any of them were real. Not until now. Finally, I reached the main road, a long stretch of asphalt lined with dim streetlights. I felt a small surge of relief seeing it. There were gas stations and fast food joints that stayed open late. There might even be people there. I picked up my pace, eager to get somewhere with more light, more activity. As I approached a 24-hour convenience store, I noticed something strange. A car was parked out front, engine idling, but there was no one inside. The door to the store was open, but I couldn't see anyone behind the counter either. My nerves were already on edge, and the sight of the empty car set them off again. It felt like a trap, like I was being lured into some kind of ambush. But I couldn't turn back. I needed help, or at least a place to gather my thoughts. I walked up to the entrance, glancing nervously around. The bell above the door jingled as I stepped inside, the sound startlingly loud in the quiet night. The store was empty, shelves lined with the usual late-night essentials, chips, drinks, and a few basic groceries. I called out, hoping the clerk was in the back, but no one answered. I stepped behind the counter, looking for a phone or something I could use to call for help, but before I could find anything, my phone buzzed again. I froze, dread washing over me like a cold wave. I didn't want to look, but I had to. With trembling hands, I pulled the phone from my pocket and read the new message. Don't hide, John. We know where you are. My blood ran cold. They were still watching, still one step ahead. I didn't know what they wanted or how far they were willing to go, but I knew one thing for sure. I couldn't keep running forever. Part of me wanted to leave the store, to just keep walking until I was miles away from everything. But another part of me, the part that was still thinking rationally, knew I needed help. I couldn't fight this alone. I needed to find someone, anyone, who could help me figure out what was going on. I stood there, caught between fight and flight, unsure of what to do next. But whatever choice I made, I knew one thing. I had to do it fast before they found me again. Standing there in that empty convenience store, I realized that I had to make a decision. The messages were getting more direct, more threatening, and I couldn't just ignore them. I had no idea who they were, but I knew they were watching, waiting for me to make my next move. My heart pounded in my chest as I considered my options. I couldn't stay there forever, and I certainly couldn't keep running aimlessly. I needed a plan. I figured the best course of action was to find someone, anyone who could help. Maybe if I wasn't alone, I'd feel safer, or at least a little more in control. I grabbed a bottle of water from the shelf, my throat was dry from panic, and made my way to the exit, hoping that the eerie quiet outside was just in my head. As I stepped out, I noticed the car parked out front was still there, engine idling. My gut told me something was off. I decided to approach cautiously, walking around the side of the store instead of directly into the open. As I moved, I kept glancing over my shoulder, expecting to see someone watching me. But the street was as deserted as before. When I reached the car, I could see it more clearly. It was an old sedan, paint chipped and windows slightly tinted. The driver's side door was open just a crack, but there was no one in the driver's seat. The interior light was on, illuminating an empty space where someone should have been. My mind raced with possibilities. Did they leave? Were they waiting for me? Despite my better judgment, I peered into the car. There was nothing inside. No bags, no signs of a struggle, just a couple of fast food wrappers on the floor. But then I noticed something on the passenger seat that made my blood run cold. It was my name written on a piece of paper in thick black marker. My full name, 
just like in the messages with a simple sentence beneath it. Stay where you are. I stumbled back, nearly tripping over my own feet. This wasn't just some random person messing with me. Whoever this was, they were playing a game, and I was the unwilling participant. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. This was far more serious than I had imagined. I had to get out of there. My legs felt like they were made of lead, but I forced myself to move, heading back down the street in the direction I had come from. The store was no longer an option, and neither was standing around waiting for something else to happen. I needed to find a place where I could gather my thoughts, somewhere that didn't feel like I was walking into another trap. As I walked, I scanned the area for any sign of life. The houses around here were dark, most of them looking like their occupants had long since gone to bed. I couldn't just start banging on doors asking for help. That would probably freak someone out, and I didn't want to make things worse. But then, just ahead, I saw a faint light glowing from a small diner at the corner of the block. It was one of those 24-hour joints, the kind that serves truckers and late-night workers who need a break from the road. I picked up my pace, praying that someone inside could help me, or at least that I'd find some comfort in being around other people. When I pushed open the door, the bell above it tinkled, and the warm smell of frying bacon and coffee hit me. There were only a few people inside, a couple sitting in a booth near the back and an older man at the counter, hunched over a newspaper. The waitress behind the counter gave me a quick glance, probably noticing how disheveled I looked, but didn't say anything as I walked in. I slid into a booth near the door, keeping my back to the wall so I could see the entrance. My heart was still racing, but the familiar sounds of a diner, sizzling from the kitchen, the low hum of a radio playing oldies, helped calm me down, if only a little. The waitress came over, a tired smile on her face. What can I get you, hun? She asked, pulling out a pad and pencil. Just a coffee, I replied, my voice sounding weaker than I'd intended. Black, please. She nodded and walked away leaving me alone with my thoughts. I took out my phone again, hesitating before unlocking it. The screen was still lit up with that last terrifying message. Stay where you are. I wanted to throw the phone away to pretend this wasn't happening, but I knew that wouldn't solve anything. As I stared at the screen, a new message popped up, causing me to jump. Nice diner choice, John. Hope you're enjoying your coffee. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. They knew I was here, they were still watching, but how? There was no one outside, no sign of anyone following me. I glanced around the diner again, but the few people there didn't seem to pay any attention to me. The couple in the back was lost in their conversation, the old man at the counter was still engrossed in his paper, and the waitress was busy refilling the sugar containers. I had to do something. I couldn't just sit there and wait for the next message, the next threat. I thought about asking the waitress for help, but what could she do? Call the police? I didn't even know what I'd tell them. Someone on the dark web was stalking me. It sounded crazy, even to me. But then, as I was considering my options, the door to the diner opened, and a man walked in. He was tall, wearing a dark hoodie pulled low over his face. He moved with purpose heading straight for the counter without glancing around. My heart leapt into my throat. Was this them? Was this the person who had been sending the messages? I tried to stay calm, but every nerve in my body was on high alert. I watched him carefully, waiting to see what he would do. The man didn't sit down. Instead, he walked over to the counter, leaned in close to the waitress, and whispered something. She glanced at me, her expression shifting to something that looked almost like fear before nodding and turning back to the kitchen. My mind raced. What had he said to her? Was he talking about me? I didn't have to wait long to find out. The man turned, pulling back his hood just enough for me to see his face. A face I didn't recognize, but one that filled me with dread nonetheless. He had a cold, calculating look in his eyes, the kind of look that told me he wasn't here for a friendly chat. Before I could react, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a piece of paper, holding it up just enough for me to see. My stomach dropped when I saw what was on it. My name, 
written in the same bold black letters as the note in the car. He didn't say a word, just stared at me, letting the message sink in. Then, as quickly as he had appeared, he turned and walked out of the diner, leaving me frozen in place. I wanted to follow him, to demand answers, but my legs wouldn't move. I was paralyzed by fear, by the realization that this was real. Someone was really coming after me and they were getting closer. The waitress came over a moment later, setting the coffee in front of me with a shaky hand. Are you okay? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. I nodded, but I knew she could see the fear in my eyes. Did he say something to you? I managed to ask. She hesitated, glancing toward the door. He just told me to give you this. She reached into her apron and pulled out another slip of paper, placing it on the table before walking away quickly, as if she didn't want to be involved any more than she already was. She hesitated, glancing toward the door. He just told me to give you this. She reached into her apron and pulled out another slip of paper, placing it on the table before walking away quickly, as if she didn't want to be involved any more than she already was. I stared at the paper for what felt like an eternity, dreading what it might say. Finally, with trembling hands, I unfolded it and read the message. Time's running out, John. You can't hide forever. I knew then that this wasn't just a game. Whatever was happening, it was serious, and I was running out of options. The fear that had been gnawing at me since the cafe was now overwhelming and I had no idea what to do next. I sat in that diner booth for what felt like hours, staring at the note as the words echoed in my head. Time's running out, John. You can't hide forever. It was like a ticking clock, counting down to some inevitable, horrifying event. My mind raced with possibilities, each one more terrifying than the last. Whoever this was, they weren't just watching. They were closing in, and I was running out of time to figure out why. I knew I couldn't stay there much longer. The waitress kept glancing at me from behind the counter, her nervous eyes betraying that she didn't want any more trouble. I couldn't blame her. I didn't want to drag anyone else into this mess. But I couldn't just walk out into the night either. The man who had left that note could be waiting for me outside, or worse, someone else could be. I decided to take a moment to collect myself. I sipped the coffee, letting the bitter warmth steady my shaking hands. As I did, I considered my options. I could call the police, but what would I even say? That someone was following me, sending me messages on the dark web? They'd probably chalk it up to some prank, or worse, think I was losing it. No, I needed more than just vague suspicions. I needed something concrete. That's when an idea struck me. The Internet Cafe. The one where this all started. Maybe there was something there. Something I missed. That could help me make sense of this nightmare. It was a long shot, but it was the only lead I had. Plus, the place was likely empty by now. Giving me a chance to look around without drawing too much attention. I threw some money on the table enough to cover the coffee and a decent tip for the waitress and headed for the door. The night air hit me like a cold slap, instantly sobering the fog of fear that had been clouding my thoughts. The street was as deserted as before, and there was no sign of the man who had delivered the note. I took that as a small mercy. As I made my way back to my car, still damaged but drivable, I kept looking over my shoulder, half expecting someone to jump out from the shadows, but nothing happened. The street remained eerily quiet, the kind of quiet that makes your skin crawl. I got in the car, started the engine and pulled away, trying to keep my mind focused on the task at hand. The drive to the internet cafe was a blur. My thoughts were a jumbled mess of fear and confusion, but one thing was clear. I needed answers. As I approached the cafe, the familiar neon sign flickered dimly in the distance, casting an unsettling glow over the empty parking lot. The place looked even more run down than before, as if it had aged years in the few hours since I'd last been there. I parked the car and took a deep breath, trying to steady my nerves before stepping out. The windows of the cafe were dark, and the sign on the door said closed, 
but I knew better. Places like this didn't really close, they just pretended to. I walked up to the door and with some reluctance gave it a gentle push. To my surprise, it creaked open without resistance. Inside, the cafe was almost exactly as I'd left it, dim, quiet, and reeking of stale coffee. The computers were still on, their screens casting an eerie glow over the worn-out desks. I half expected to see someone sitting there, watching me, but the place was empty. That didn't do much to calm my nerves. I walked over to the computer I had used earlier, my footsteps echoing in the empty space. The chair squeaked as I sat down, and I quickly logged back into the system. My heart was racing as I navigated through the history, hoping to find something that would explain how everything had gone so horribly wrong. At first, there was nothing out of the ordinary. The usual browser history, a few opened tabs, nothing that screamed, this is it. But then, as I scrolled through the logs, I found something that didn't make sense. There was a program running in the background, something I hadn't noticed before. It wasn't a browser or anything that should have been there. It was a script, something with a long cryptic name made up of random letters and numbers. My pulse quickened as I clicked on it, revealing a text file filled with what looked like lines of code interspersed with what seemed like timestamps. I didn't know much about coding, but even I could tell this wasn't just some harmless program. There were references to IP addresses, encrypted links, and, chillingly, coordinates. The coordinates were the first thing that caught my eye. I quickly copied them and pasted them into a map application, praying they wouldn't lead anywhere. But they did. The location was less than a mile from where I was sitting, in the middle of a residential neighborhood I didn't recognize. My stomach twisted into knots. What was this? Why were there coordinates? And why here? I couldn't make sense of it, but I knew I had to find out. As I sat there staring at the screen, another thought crossed my mind. What if this was a trap? What if whoever was behind this wanted me to find these coordinates, to lead me somewhere I shouldn't go? But if that were the case, why leave the information in such an obvious place? Before I could think it over any further, my phone buzzed again, making me jump. I had almost forgotten about it in the chaos of the last few minutes. With a sinking feeling, I unlocked it and read the new message. Good. Now come and see what we've been waiting to show you. The message sent chills down my spine. They knew I had found the coordinates. They were expecting me. But for what? My brain screamed at me to stop, to leave the cafe and drive as far away as possible. But another part of me, the part that needed answers, pushed me forward. Against my better judgment, I printed out the map with the coordinates and stuffed it into my pocket. I shut down the computer, not wanting to leave any trace of what I had discovered, and made my way back to the car. The drive to the location was short, but it felt like an eternity. Every shadow seemed to stretch and reach out. Every distant noise made my heart race. I kept the radio off, the silence of the car amplifying the pounding of my heart. When I arrived at the coordinates, I found myself in front of an old abandoned house. It was the kind of place kids dared each other to enter on Halloween. Windows boarded up, paint peeling off the walls, the front yard overgrown with weeds. The house looked like it had been empty for years, but the faint glow of a single light from inside told me otherwise. I parked a little ways down the street not wanting to draw attention to myself and walked cautiously toward the house. The night was eerily quiet, the only sound being the crunch of gravel under my feet. I reached the front door, which was slightly ajar, and hesitated. Every instinct screamed at me to turn back to forget this ever happened, but I couldn't. I needed to know what was inside. Taking a deep breath, I pushed the door open and stepped inside. The air was thick with dust, and the floorboards creaked under my weight. The light I had seen from outside was coming from a single, flickering bulb hanging from the ceiling in what looked like the living room. There was nothing else in the room. No furniture, no decorations. Just the light and the overwhelming sense that I wasn't alone. I took a step forward, my breath catching in my throat, and that's when I heard it. 
a low, almost imperceptible whisper coming from somewhere deeper in the house. It was a voice, but I couldn't make out the words. My heart was racing again, every nerve on edge, but I had come this far. I couldn't turn back now. I followed the sound, moving slowly through the empty rooms. The whispering grew louder as I approached a doorway at the end of the hall. It was dark beyond the threshold, and I couldn't see what was on the other side. But the voice was there, calling me, drawing me in. I reached the doorway, my hand trembling as I reached for the light switch. When I flipped it, the room was flooded with a dim yellow light, revealing something that made my blood run cold. In the center of the room was a table, and on that table was a laptop, its screen glowing faintly in the darkness. But it wasn't the laptop that terrified me. It was what was displayed on the screen. It was a live feed, showing me, standing in the doorway, staring at the screen. Before I could react, the whispering stopped, and a new message appeared on the screen. We've been waiting for you, John. Welcome home. My breath caught in my throat. Home? What did they mean? My mind was spinning, unable to process what was happening. But then, as I stood there frozen in fear, the door behind me creaked open, and I felt a presence looming just inches away. I didn't dare turn around. I couldn't. Whatever was behind me, it was the reason I had been brought here. And somehow, deep down, I knew this was only the beginning. In that moment, standing in the dim light of that empty room with a presence looming behind me, I felt an overwhelming sense of dread. My body was frozen, muscles locked in place as if they refused to acknowledge the terrifying reality unfolding around me. The screen in front of me showed my own terrified reflection, captured in real time by some unseen camera. The message still glowed ominously on the laptop. We've been waiting for you, John. Welcome home. But home? This place was anything but. It was a decaying shell, a forgotten house that had seen better days decades ago. Yet somehow, the word home sent a chill down my spine that was deeper than any of the threats or pictures I'd received. It was like it was speaking to some part of me that I couldn't quite remember or didn't want to. The presence behind me didn't move, didn't make a sound. It just waited as if it knew that I would have to turn around eventually. I had no choice. I had to confront whatever or whoever was standing there. My mind raced through possibilities, each one worse than the last. Was it the man from the diner? The person who had sent those messages? Or was it something even more sinister? Summoning every ounce of courage I had left, I slowly turned around. My heart pounded in my chest, every beat louder than the last. When I finally faced the door, what I saw wasn't what I had expected. It was nothing. The doorway was empty, the hall beyond as silent and dark as before. The oppressive presence I had felt just moments ago seemed to evaporate into the air, leaving me alone in the room. My mind struggled to make sense of it. Had it been my imagination? A trick of the light? Or was something else at play here? something I couldn't comprehend. I turned back to the laptop, hoping for some kind of explanation. The screen had gone dark, the live feed replaced by a new message. Don't be afraid, John. We've always been with you. My breath caught in my throat. Always. The word resonated in my mind, stirring up memories that I had long buried. Flashes of childhood, fleeting images of dark corners, shadows that had seemed too solid too alive. Memories I had dismissed as nightmares, as tricks my mind had played on me as a child. But now they came rushing back with terrifying clarity. It wasn't just the dark web, the messages, or the stalker. It was something much deeper, something that had been lurking in the background of my life for as long as I could remember. The feeling of being watched, of not being alone even in the safest places. All those moments of inexplicable fear, the shadows that seemed to move when I wasn't looking. They hadn't been figments of my imagination. They had been real. 
I stepped back, my legs trembling. The weight of this realization almost too much to bear. The walls of the room seemed to close in on me, the air thickening with that same oppressive presence I had felt earlier. I wanted to run, to escape, but there was nowhere to go. This wasn't something I could outrun. It was something that had been with me all along. And then, the final message appeared on the screen. Come home, John. It's time to remember. The word struck me like a physical blow. The laptop's screen flickered. And for a brief moment, I saw an image. A house, not unlike the one I was in, but not the same. It was a place I recognized. A place I had once called home, long before I could understand what that word truly meant. The memory hit me like a flood, washing away the years of denial. I had lived here, not in this house, but somewhere like it. As a child, before my family had moved, I had lived in a place that had felt wrong, even then. The whispers, the shadows, they had started there, growing louder and stronger as I grew older. But we had left, moved away, and I had convinced myself that it had all been a dream, a product of an overactive imagination. I had forgotten about it, pushed it deep into the recesses of my mind where it couldn't hurt me anymore. But now it had found me again. It had never really left. Tears welled up in my eyes as the truth became clear. The dark web, the messages, the man who had followed me, they were all connected to this, to a past I had tried so hard to forget. This was about more than just stalking or threats. This was something deeply personal, something tied to the very core of who I was. I had to confront it. I couldn't keep running from it, not anymore. Whatever it was, whether it was a part of me or something that had attached itself to me, I had to face it head on. I had to remember. With a deep breath, I took one last look at the laptop. The screen had gone completely dark now, the presence in the room growing stronger with every passing second. I could feel it all around me, in the walls, in the air, even in the floor beneath my feet. It was waiting for me to take the next step, to acknowledge its existence, to let it in. And I did. I let the memories flood back, the fear, the whispers, the shadows. I let myself remember the house, the nights spent wide awake, listening to things that shouldn't have been there. I let myself feel the terror that had gripped me as a child, the terror that I had tried so hard to forget. For with the fear came something else, understanding. This thing, this presence, had always been a part of my life, but it didn't want to harm me. It wanted to be acknowledged, to be remembered. It was a part of me, something that had been with me all along, and all it wanted was to come home. As I stood there letting the memories wash over me, the oppressive presence began to change. It softened, the darkness in the room lifting just slightly. The whispers that had once filled me with dread now seemed almost comforting, like a lullaby I had forgotten. I wasn't afraid anymore. I understood now. I took a deep breath and whispered into the silence. I remember. And just like that, the presence faded away. The room was quiet again, the air clear and still. The laptop screen flickered back to life one last time, showing nothing but a blank desktop. The game was over, the threat gone. I didn't know what would happen next, but I knew one thing for sure. I wasn't alone. I never had been. The fear that had haunted me all my life wasn't something to be run from, but something to be faced, understood, and accepted. I walked out of the house, feeling lighter than I had in years. The night was still dark, the street still empty, but the oppressive weight that had been bearing down on me was gone. I didn't need to be afraid anymore. As I drove away, leaving that house and all its memories behind, I realized that I was finally free. Free from the fear, the shadows, the whispers. Free to live my life without the weight of the past holding me down. But as I glanced in the rearview mirror, I saw something that made me smile. A shadow just barely visible sitting quietly in the back seat watching over me. It wasn't menacing, wasn't threatening. It was just there, 
a reminder of what I had faced, of what I had overcome. And I knew then that it wasn't a curse, but a gift, a gift that had been with me all along. Finally, I was home.